The Yaron Brook Show starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. Morning, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, this is Yaron Brook, and uh, thank you for joining me uh, for the next uh, couple of hours. We're going to be talking a lot of economics today, uh, a lot going on. Uh, obviously, tax reform came through yesterday. We, we've got uh, the president uh, declaring that, they are going to, that he is going to reduce the regulatory burden on American businesses to 1960s levels. Uh, and uh, whether that is possible and, uh, and what that implies is interesting. The Fed also increased interest rates this last week uh, by a quarter percent, small amount, but still, uh, and uh, predicting to increase interest rates even more next year. So um, uh, a, a lot going on there. We're going we're gonna to focus on those uh, tax reform, deregulation, Fed, and then uh, – you know, if there's time, there's a bunch of other things to talk about. I certainly want to talk about uh, the election. There's an election tomorrow in Chile, which is, uh, I think, really, really interesting and really quite important. But uh, but let's let's see when we get there. All right, tax reform, uh, and and let's 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 create a context for this. Uh, where do I come from uh, in looking at something like tax reform or looking at something like the economy generally? I don't view the government as really having a role to play or should have a role to play in our economy. I don't think the government should be responsible for economic growth or economic prosperity or economic success or trying to remedy the problems supposedly uh, created by uh, inequality or, or, or anything like that. The government's role, as I think the founding fathers believed, the government's role is to protect us. The government's role is to protect our rights, our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to protect our freedoms, to leave us alone so that we can start businesses, hire people, sell products, buy products, invest or not invest, consume or not consume. So my view is, really, I think the founder's view was, I think the fundamental idea about America is that the government is there to kind of set property rights, the rules, if you will, of the game, to make sure that fraud is not committed, to protect us from cheats and crooks and bad guys. But other than that, basically, to leave us alone, to let us live our lives as we see fit, as long as we're not hurting our neighbors, it's not as on, if we don't stick our hands in our neighbor's pocket. It's none of the government's business. For that matter, it's none of our neighbor's business. Now, what does that imply for tax policy? It's kind of difficult to jump from there to tax policy because the first place one would think to go from there, from the role of government, for what the government should be doing is to government spending. It's to the budget. But Republicans seem to always have this backwards. I, I'm not even talking about Democrats who are completely clueless and, and, and when it comes to these issues, so, so I, I'm ignoring them completely, right? But Republicans seem to have this backwards. Instead of focusing on shrinking government spending to, you know, to only spending on those things that protect us, only th those things that the government is supposed to do. Republicans seems to almost always focus on the revenue line, not on the spending line. As partially as a consequence of that, as a consequence of both Democrats and Republicans doing this, we've got $20 trillion worth of debt. Indeed, if you count the unfunded liabilities, that is the promises we have made to all of you to pay you Social Security and to pay you Medicare, and to pay you Medicaid, all the things that the government has promised that it's going to have to pay over the next 50, 60, 70 years. If you look at those unfunded liabilities, the promises that we made over the next 70 years, and you kind of look at them, what is that number today? If, if we had to put, if, if we had to take a, 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 a huge amount of money and put it in the bank, so that we can afford to pay all that. Given that the taxes we're raising today and over the next 50 years are just going to pay 
for everything we've already committed to. So if you take into account that baby boomers are retiring, therefore Social Security going up, Medicaid going up, what are the added expenses that we can project over the next 70 years? Then what you get is a number somewhere between, because no economist really knows and it depends on a lot of assumptions and everything, somewhere between 60 to, I don't know, 150 billion, trillion, trillion, trillion T dollars. Now, that's a number that is unimaginable. We can't even think in those terms that are so large. So today's total debt of the U.S. government is $20 trillion, and I'm talking about just federal. I'm not even counting state and local governments and, and pension plans and all of that. And then you add Social Security and Medicare, that's another $100 plus trillion. I mean, that's where the problem is. The problem's on the spending side. We are spending way, way more money than we can afford. If you were running a household on the basis of running a massive deficit every single year, borrowing more and more and more money to the point where, by some measures, your total debt was equal to your total earning for a whole year and increasing with no Nobody, nobody is projecting that going away in the future. So constant increased deficits, constant increasing debt. I mean, you, you, you couldn't live that way. And yet somehow we let the government, we let the government do it. So you got to focus on the spending side and you got to cut spending dramatically, significantly, massively. But nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to talk about that. That's hard. They actually have to make real decisions. I mean, real decisions. Right? And, it, it, like, what, what are you going to cut? Whose subsidies are you going to take away? Are you going to cut farm subsidies? Are you going to cut uh, solar subsidies and windmill subsidies, which the, nobody's doing? Are you going to uh, cut welfare? Are you going to cut Social Security? What about cutting Medicare? Because that's where the real costs are. I mean, the fact is, the fact is that unless we reform Medicare, and I know, I know, it's a political suicide because the American people don't want us to cut Medicare. But the fact is that unless you cut Medicare, nothing else you do matters. Nothing else you do matters. Medicare is most of the debt going forward. But nobody wants to talk about that. Medicare is going to be bigger than defense. Medicare will be the biggest expenditure on the federal budget very soon, by far. Not even close. But you can't talk about that. Oh, what about the poor people? What about all the sick people? What about all the old people? We can't do that to them. Well, what about all the young people? What about all the people going to have to tax? What about all the, the lowest standard of living future generations are going to have to live with? What about reduced economic growth? What about all the suffering you're going to cause in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years because the economy is not going to grow very fast or at all or maybe shrink? What about all of that? Uh, nobody cares. Nobody cares because we've got suffering. We've got people who need health care right now and if we have to suffer if we have to sacrifice future generation for the sake of that well what are future gener generations for if not to borrow at the expense so we can fund making ourselves feel better about ourselves today you know by taking care of I don't know, old people by taking care of our parents and grandparents that's what's important so as i said the problem is spending and nobody wants to deal with it so it's much easier to deal with taxes and so republicans had an opportunity to do something really dramatic with taxes they had an opportunity because they have a majority in the house a majority in the senate and donald trump has basically said he'd sign anything to really shake up and reform and completely restructure our tax system and, and do something really, really dramatic. And unfortunately, they haven't done that. I mean, they've done it a little bit on the corporate side. 
lowering taxes from 35% to 21% on the corporate side is it, significant. It's big, and, and they should be applauded for that. That is terrific. It's still, by the way, not the lowest in the uh, developed world. The lowest corporate tax in the developed world is, uh, by, is Ireland. Ireland has a 12.5% uh, corporate tax rate. It's not even um, the lowest in, uh, among the bigger economies. So uh, Germany, you know, Germany, a, a massive welfare state, an economy that produces and, and has done very well. And people say, well, wait a minute. How can Germany do so well? How, how, how come Germany has performed, the German economy has performed so well over the last, isn't it more socialist than America? So how come Germany's done so well? How come the German economy has done relatively well? And the, you know, even relative to the United States. Well, to answer that, we're going to do that after the break. We're going to take a quick break here. You're listening to the Iran Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. PhD. You're clear. Media contributor. This is the Iran Brook Show. The Blaze. PhD, author, media contributor. This is the Yaron Brook Show, the Blaze Radio Network. Sorry about that, guys. I was a uh, bout of nausea. I don't know. As, as some of you know, I'm, I'm uh, recovering from surgery, and uh, uh, maybe that had something to do with it. All right. Um, we are talking, we are talking uh, U.S. economy. We're talking about tax cut. And, and one of the things that people don't realize is uh, that even after the tax cut in the corporate rates, the United States will still have, will not have the lowest uh, corporate tax rate in, in kind of the developed world, particularly if you'd count uh, a lot of the European countries. As I, as I said before the break, Ireland has a 12.5%, 12.5% corporate rate. Wouldn't it be cool if we had met, uh, if we had matched uh, the uh, uh, Ireland, uh, the UK, has a slightly under 20% uh, corporate tax rate. Uh, so even the UK, I think it's 19% corporate tax rate. So the UK has a lower uh, corporate tax rate than, um, than the United States. But w- an interesting case study is Germany because a lot of people always ask me, Ron, how come Germany does so well? Germany's got a much bigger welfare state than the United States, and it's got all these labor regulations and all this stuff. And there's this perception of Germany as kind of a socialist state and yet, it, it's done, I mean, it hasn't done as well as the United States since the, since the, since the Great Depression, but it's done, uh, recession, sorry, since the Great Recession, but it's done fairly well over the last uh, uh, 10 or more years, or, or 20 years. People ask me, how come? It's a socialist country. You, you don't believe in socialism. And what they don't realize is the extent to which, in some respects, Germany I- I- is less socialist less interventionist than the United States is, and maybe corporate tax is a good illustration of this. In 2000, corporate taxes in Germany were 42.5%, higher than the United States. The United States has basically been static since 2000 at 35%, for a long time at 35%. German corporate tax rates were 42.5%. And then in 2001, they lowered them to 26%. And then since then, in 2008, Germany in 2008, as a response to financial crisis, actually lowered their tax rate to 15.8%. So Germany's corporate tax rate right now is 15.8%. And the world did not end. This is a response to crazy Democrats who think the world's going to end because we lowered the corporate tax rate. The world did not end when Germany lowered its tax rate by more by more than half, from 42.5% to 15.8%. That's way more than half. It's almost, almost by two-thirds, right? And the German economy has done fairly well. In addition, if you go back and look in the early 2000s, Germany engaged in massive labor deregulation. So all the labor laws that really constrained labor mobility and flexibility in Germany were massively deregulated. And then a combination of labor deregulation, some other deregulation they were engaged in, and the lowering of corporate tax rates has done a lot of good for Germany. 
And in many respects, Germany's in better shape, or in some respects, Germany's in better shape than the United States. Suddenly, its corporate tax rate is going to be lower than the U.S.'s corporate tax rate, even after the Republicans lower it to 21%. Wouldn't it have been cool if they'd lowered it to 15%? I mean, zero is my personal ideal, but okay, you know, no, nobody goes, nobody's, nobody's that radical, right? So, um, so corporate tax rate is lowered, uh, and, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That'll raise wages. You'll see. Uh, in the next five years, you'll see wages, real wages rising. It's going to actually have a deflationary impact on prices. It's going to actually have, uh, create pressure on prices to come down on certain products. When corporate taxes, tax rates go down, it, 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 it puts pressure, downward pressure on prices. Companies are making more money. They can afford to lower prices on the products that they sell. And there's competition to lower prices. And it, it, it at least in the short run, will raise corporate profits. In the long run, it doesn't raise corporate profits. But in the short run, it will raise corporate profits, which will reward uh, shareholders. But that's only a short run effect. A long run effect, uh, uh, higher wages, which you've seen in Germany, and lower prices. So we all benefit. We all benefit when corporate taxes are cut. And a good cut, good deal. What would have been great? You know, this is my wish list for what I wish they would have done. What would have been great is if they had then cut, you know, uh, things like all the subsidies to businesses, all the loopholes, all the tax benefits, I don't know, that the windmill industry gets and the solar energy gets, and I'm sure some that they oil and gas get or whatever, cut it all, you know. So, so lower the tax rate, I would lower it to 15% in that case, and then cut out all these deductions and exclusions and subsidies and loopholes and cronyism and all this stuff. Make it really, 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 really simple, right? That would have been huge. That would have really, really had an impact, much more than just cutting the corporate Too tax rate. Nice. Getting, getting over the idea of trying to manipulate the U.S. economy by subsidizing, by giving preferential treatment, all of those kind of things. Ah, oh, what a breath of fresh air that would have been if that would have happened. All right, by the way, if you have an opinion about tax rates, if, if you want to tell me how you think tax rates are going to affect you personally or what you think about it, or generally on economics, we're doing an economic show today. Uh, if you have a question about economics, feel free to call 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393. Uh, anything on the, on the Fed interest rates, on uh, tax reform, on deregulation, or in any other, or what they're teaching you, those of you as students at the universities, or what they're teaching you in economics class One at, minute. You know, at, at your school, because I know you're getting a lot of garbage there. I know you're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of real bad stuff there. Um, all right, when we come back, we're going we're gonna to have to take a hard break here in less than a minute. When we come back, uh, I want to talk more about, the, uh, about taxes, about tax reform, what they did in terms of uh, foreign income, bringing, trying to bring some of that money home, what that means, bring that money back to 30. the U.S., what that actually, what that actually means. Um, and I also want to talk about individual tax rates, the tax rates me and you are going to pay. How, how are those impacted? 20. And again, if, if, if you guys uh, want in on the conversation, if you have uh, a view about your economic state, 888-900-3393, after, uh, after this break uh, that we're going to. And uh, after that, we're going to talk about deregulation and about Fed policy. Wait that. You're on. The Yaron Brook Show. All right, we're back. Back talking about taxes and uh, the tax reform. Uh, the, the, it looks like the Senate and the House will both vote on it uh, on uh, this coming week. Uh, we should have a completely new tax regime by the end of next week, by Christmas. Your Christmas present, some uh, some additional cash in your pocket. I think that's true 
for most of us, not necessarily for everybody, but for most of us, uh, we will see some uh, a little bit, some of us a little bit, some people a little bit more uh, cash in their pockets. Uh, just a few more things on, on uh, corporate taxes, and then I'm going to go. Uh, Miles is calling in from, he, he's got some tax tax plan concerns. Uh, we'll take that. Um, you know, they had an opportunity, for example, to eliminate interest deduction on uh, uh, interest deductibility from taxes. Right now, when a corporation pays interest on the debt that it's taken, it can deduct that interest from its taxes. When it pays, when it gives shareholders dividends, it cannot deduct those dividends from its taxes. So it's a, dividends are taxed twice. You, they're taxed at the corporate level once as income. And then when you get the dividends, they're taxed at, at, at your income tax rate. This, that absolutely makes no sense. Why should the tax code make it more beneficial for corporations to take on debt than to issue equity. It favors get accumulating leverage. It favors companies issuing debt to buy their own stock, which makes no sense. So uh, it would have been nice if they would have treated both the same, that is, both either made both deductible from taxes or neither deductible from taxes. They've changed it a little bit. They've limited the amount of interest they can, they can deduct, but that's even worse because that's kind of telling corporations it's good to go up to X percent. It's not good to go to Y percent. It's, again, the central planning. I hate it when politicians try to manage our lives or try to manage corporations' lives. Just leave us alone. Set simple, neutral rules and everything else alone. Uh, the foreign income the corporations have generated – can now be brought home with no tax penalty. There's a one-time tax penalty for the, the, the stuff that they've accumulated up to date. Uh, that's good. I, I mean, it might go into investments. It might be into buyouts. Who knows? But anything that gives corporations more flexibility, flexibility in terms of how they use their cash uh, is a good thing in, uh, in, uh, in my book. All right, we've also got... Um, Business investment, you know, you can immediately deduct, which uh, increase, which is supposed to increase incentives for invest for 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 investment. So overall, I tell on the corporate side, you know, things are better. Uh, the tax reduction is substantial. Could have been more, and could have been simpler. Could have been more dramatic. Could have been fewer exclusions and deductions and all that crap so that you what i like is i want tax policy to the extent that you need taxes to fund revenues to fund government expenditures most of government expenditures today in my view are illegitimate but the ones that are legitimate is is a tax that's neutral in terms of changing people's behavior a tax that's as neutral as possible in terms of changing people's behavior the corporate tax is are not quite there yet. Better than it was, not quite where I would like it to be. All right, we're going to take a quick call from Miles. Hi, Miles. You're on the Iran Book Show. Hi. Uh, hi, Iran. Uh, I have uh, three points to make uh, on this uh, tax plan. First sure. is uh, on the business side. I seem to remember a few years ago, uh, there were tax cuts given to business, but they were tied to business hiring people. In other words, it was conditioned in, in order to qualify for the, for the tax cut. That's not the case here. No. Uh, businesses get tax cuts. They can do whatever they want with the money. They can reinvest it in their corporate in stock. They can pay executives. Yep. But there's no guarantee that it's going to go to hiring people. That's right. That's 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 my first gripe. Okay. Uh, on the pers on the personal side, uh, the fact that there's a cap on the salt. Uh, affects me because uh, there's a ten thousand dollars cap on the salt. I pay more than ten thousand dollars in salt. What and salt? What are you talking about? Salt. Tax. Explain what salt is. Well, salt is the uh, state and local taxes. Okay, good deduction. Uh, and I pay more than ten thousand dollars, which is what the uh, the uh, this plan caps the, that deduction at. So uh, I'll have less uh, a lesser deduction, and the result is I'll be paying more taxes. Yep. Yep. I'm a middle I'm, I'm, I'm a middle class guy, so uh, 
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get nailed in that one too. Where do you live, uh, Miles? You live in South Carolina. What's your corporate ta- What's your uh, What's your state uh, tax there? Uh, the state uh, income tax rate is, uh, I believe, uh, seven and a half percent. Okay, it's high. Wow, in South Carolina, I'm surprised. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but I'm originally from New York. If I lived in New York, I'd really be. Yeah, I'm in California, really so I know. I, I feel your pain. Believe me, Miles, I feel your pain. All right, what's the third point? The third point is uh, now. Now I'm trying to re- remember what that what that point is. So um, we had corporate tax rates. We had cap on state and local and property. Um, you forget. Well, I'll, 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 I'll let it go at those, at those two points. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Miles. Uh, okay. So let me take let me take on both of those. Uh, let me take on both of those. Corporate tax rates on business, they're not telling businesses they have to hire, which is great. God forbid the government starts telling businesses how they run their businesses, how to spend their money. God forbid that, they, that, that, that uh, companies hire people only because it gives them a tax break, not because these people are going to be uh, uh, actually productive and useful. The best thing we can do is not try to tell businesses what to do with the money. Businessmen know much more about what to do with that money than we do in terms of making it productive. So what are businessmen going to do with that money? Well, they're going to invest it. What does it mean to invest it? It, it might not seem like they're hiring people because they might be investing in a startup or they might be investing in a new venture, or they might be investing in some financial instruments. But the fact is that every one of those, that money ultimately goes to a productive activity, which, yeah, it creates jobs, but more importantly, it's creating wealth. And what drives the economy is wealth creation. And wealth creation also creates jobs. You cannot create wealth long-term without jobs being created as well. The idea that we can manipulate the economy by giving a little bit here and a little bit there and telling them what breaks they should have and what breaks they can't have and so on in ways that maximize uh, uh, work is, again, this fallacy of central planning as if uh, uh, the central planner knows, knows how to manipulate all these factors in order to create an optimal situation. No, uh, I mean, it, 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 I'm so glad that the tax cuts are not contingent on corporations behaving in any particular way. Even stock buybacks. Stock buybacks are good. Why do corporations engage in stock buybacks? Because it's, it's um, more profitable for them, they believe, to buy their stock than to invest the money. Why? Because they're no good investments. They can't find any good investments. And rather than the cash just sitting in the bank, they hand it over to shareholders and let shareholders decide what to do with it. Let shareholders figure out where to invest it and how to invest it. And those shareholders invested in what? They invested in new projects, in new ventures, in new capabilities. When corporations sit on a lot of cash, That's not a good thing. You want that money invested in its highest return. And if Apple can't find the best investments possible for the cash that it has, then give it to the shareholders and let them try to find the best investment possible. So the idea is to provide incentives so that the cash is invested in its best use, where they can get the highest return. And if it's not in the corporation, then then it shouldn't be with the corporation. And that's why they should do buybacks. They should give out dividends. They should send the cash to people who can better utilize it, give it to people who can better utilize it, instead of hiring people. For what? If, If the hiring people actually generated a good return, then they would hire them instead of, you know, buying back the stocks. All right, we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, when we get back, we'll continue our discussion. We'll take on the second objection Miles had uh, on, on taxes. We'll be right back. You're listening to Ron Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network.
Yaron Brook. Hey guys. All right, so Mile asked some really good questions, and uh, the first one was, well, why can't we force corporations to invest in jobs? Corporations would invest in jobs if those jobs were good investments. What does it mean, good investments? That they made money, right? And, and, and this is where I think a lot of people have cognitive dissonance. Every job that you have, somebody's making money off of it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be investing in you. The only reason I hire people to work for me is because they make me more productive and they make me be able to have more profits. So corporations would take the tax saving and invest in hiring people only if those people were good investments. And if they were good investments, that is better investments than buying back the stock, they would do that. And if they're not, then you don't want them from an economics perspective. You don't want them hiring people. You don't want them hiring people to do non-productive work, to do non-profitable work. So what you want the money is to return it to shareholders and let them find the best possible investments in the economy to apply their money to. And I know I'm being somewhat professorial, but how you can understand the, the, the tax issues without this, right? There's a lot being thrown out here. The second one is this cap on state, local, and, and uh, property taxes that being imposed. Now, I think that the cap was a cop-out. They should have had no deductibility for state, local, and property taxes. Why should you get that deducted? Why should you, why, why should you be shielded from your choice to live in a high-tax state? Why should... Why should people who live in low-tax states, in a sense, in a sense, be subsidizing people who live in high-tax states? Right. Now, I'm going to suffer because of this, but the fact is that the federal government shouldn't be encouraging states to raise their taxes because the burden of it doesn't fall on the residents of California. It falls on other... So, Think of it on other states. Think of it, the, the, the federal government has to raise X number of dollars. Right? And they're giving Californians a break by letting Californians deduct a massive amount of taxes. They pay Sacramento. And as a consequence, people in, in I don't know, in Nevada who have a zero tax rate at the, at the state level have to pay, in a sense, higher corporate taxes to make up whatever the federal government has to ch achieve. So no, I, I would like to see no deductibility, zero deductibility, which will increase the incentive of people to leave states that are high-tax states or to put political pressure on those states to reduce their taxes. I don't want to reward California and New York for the fact that they have high, high taxes. Now, this $10,000 means I won't even be able to deduct my uh, my property taxes. My property taxes are higher than the $10,000 because I live in California. Never mind my, uh, oh my God. I mean, I'm just thinking now of how much my state taxes are. My state taxes are enormous and I won't be able to t t deduct them. Now, the fact is that I couldn't deduct them anyway because of the alternative minimum tax, uh, which I've been paying for the last few years and many of us have been paying uh, so, no, I, I, I'm not only for the cap, I wish, I wish it was capped at zero. I wish you couldn't deduct anything. And indeed, I think there should be many, many more uh, eliminations of deductions. So if you look at the personal tax, if we go over to the personal tax, so what they've done is they've changed the brackets. Uh, there were seven brackets, and there are still seven brackets. Now, that is sad in my view. One of the reasons to do tax reform is to simplify. They could have easily reduced the number of brackets to three. I mean, ideally one, a, a flat tax would be ideal. But, but okay, three would be better than seven. Why are some people taxed at 32, others at 35, and others at 37? And then the two brackets, 22 and 24. And then there's 10 and 12. Why not have one at 23 and one at 11? I, I don't know. I mean... It, 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 yeah, if we're having seven tax brackets, why not have 13? 
What about 27 tax brackets? Tackers form was a real opportunity to simplify. Simplify means fewer. Fewer brackets and fewer deductions. Now, some of the deductions, it's good. They've, they've done away with a personal exemption and they raised the standard deduction. I don't have any problem with raising the standard deduction. Basically, what that does is it wipes out uh, many low-income people from paying any taxes at all because the standard deduction is higher than what they have to pay in taxes. It's, it's higher than, in some cases, their income. So uh, uh, the new standard deduction for a married couple is 24000 So if there's a young couple that's making less than 24000 they're basically not going to pay any taxes. All right. Um, now we have child tax credits. I don't believe there should be any child tax credits. Why is the government incentivizing us to have children or giving us a reward for having children? Uh, and, and uh, you know, that reward is there for married people, unmarried people. I mean, if you have a child, you should bear the full cost of that. So I, I, I don't think they should be tax credit. I don't think they should deduct state and local taxes. They've gone from you can itemize everything to now you can deduct up to 10000 You shouldn't be able to deduct any of that. Mortgage interest deduction, they reduced it from a million-dollar cap to $750,000 cap. What a wimpy, how wimpy is that, right? Why not again? Why not make it zero? Now, I would have, again, suffered because I take a, a mortgage deduction. But why is the government incentivizing me to take out a mortgage rather than paying cash or incentivizing me to take out a mortgage rather than renting? None of the government's business. Stay out of, stay out of my purchasing decisions. Why are you trying to social engineer me? This is part of the reason why we had a housing crisis. Because we incentivize people to buy when they couldn't afford to buy, when they shouldn't have been buying, when they should have been renting. The alternative minimum tax, they had an opportunity to get rid of it completely, uh, just a, a whole complexity, which hurts uh, particularly uh, upper, upper middle class people. They pre preserved it and they've narrowed it. Again, a wimpy, wimpy solution. Alternative minimum tax, oh, that's alternative minimum tax. Uh, medical expenses, they should have made health insurance deductible. So if I buy a health insurance as an individual, why shouldn't I be able to deduct it? But if, when a business buys health insurance for me, they get to deduct it. So why do we have unequal treatment of, of medical insurance deductions? Why do we prefer employer-based, again, social engineering, telling me where I should buy my health insurance, incentivizing me to buy health insurance through my employer? But I'm not employed anymore. I'm self-employed. Why, why has my situation vis-a-vis -vis healthcare gotten worse because I'm no longer getting a salary because I don't have an employer anymore? And then medical expenses, so you can still uh, you know, deduct some of those kind of in emergencies. Student loans you can deduct. Graduate tuition you can deduct. Uh, and they changed some stuff with regard to alimony. A big one is a state tax. A state tax doesn't affect many people. The, 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 uh, it was 40% on 5.6 million and above, and uh, 11 million for married couples. Now it's 11 million for individuals, 22 for married couples. Uh, it's still 40%. They were going to make it zero, which would have been ideal. But they've raised it so much, very few people are going to be paying it. But again, why are we penalizing people who have a lot of money? Why are we penalizing success? Why are we penalizing high incomes? You know, they're the people who invest. Two minutes. They're the people who create. Uh, Miles was concerned about job creation. You want to create jobs? Lower the top marginal income tax rate a lot. Re eliminate estate taxes. And most importantly, capital gains and dividends unaffected. They stay at 238 but wait a minute, that's where you get the most bang for the buck from an economics perspective. So why, why weren't those reduced, eliminated? Zero should be the capital gains and dividends. That would have been a revolution. That would have been the best thing the economy has ever seen. If they were really, really serious about economic growth, they would have eliminated the capital gains and dividend tax. I mean, that would have been amazing. You would have seen stuff. One minute. Uh, really really 
dramatic changes to the U.S. economy. Okay, um, a bunch of other things. Uh, Pass through businesses get get some benefits. It's not clear to me how that how that exactly is going to work. We're gonna have to see some examples of that and what it works. So generally, yeah, Sorry. tax plans okay for the individuals. Had an opportunity to be brilliant. Had an opportunity to make big impact, particularly if they lowered capital gains and dividends, lowered the top man marginal income tax rate, and completely simplified it and taken away all the social engineering. They didn't. They're wimps. Applying They're cowards. the principles of rational self-interest and individual. You clear? On your radio, it's the Yaron Brook Show on the Blaze Radio. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the second hour of today's show. We're in the, you're listening to Yaron Brook Show. And this is the Blaze Radio Network. Uh, if you want to ask a kind of random question, not necessarily on the topic today, um, we, we allocate the last segment of the second hour for that. So uh, in about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. Uh, so uh, feel free to call then. The number is 888-900-3393. 888-900-3393. If you want to call now and just stay on the line until then. That's fine. Just tell the, 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 the call screener that you're in for the final segment that you want to ask a question uh, Ask a question about a topic that's not directly related to what we're talking about today. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let's talk again about taxes. I want to I give you the principle that I, I see in terms of taxes. Um, you've got a certain level of revenue that uh, you, know, you want to raise. And I would argue that the ideal would be as low of a revenue as possible. So, so uh, I would like to see government spending come down significantly. But the way to raise that revenue should be, given that we have taxes and given there's no way around it, is to have the lowest rate possible. Have it as flat as possible and as simple as possible. That in terms of in terms of individual tax rate, corporate tax rate should be zero because they're primarily paid by um, consumers and, and and workers anyway. And when it comes to double taxation, should be zero. That's why capital gains shouldn't be taxed and dividends shouldn't be taxed. So no double taxation. Maximum simplicity, so no deductions, no exclusions, nothing, and maximum flatness. Unfortunately, this tax reform, and, and the lowest rate possible, given the amount of revenue you are, are trying to raise. Unfortunately, this tax plan doesn't, doesn't qualify by any of those metrics, uh, other than on the corporate side where it lowered rates dramatically. The only, the only good thing about this rate, this tax plan from an individual perspective, is that it lowered some of the brackets. That, that's good. That's good. But it hasn't dramatically simplified things, and it hasn't dramatically uh, flattened things, which is what I would have liked to have seen. All right. Um, we're going to take a couple of calls. We've got Skyla on the line, and then we're going to take Mark. Hey, Skyla, how's it going? Season greetings, Dr. Brooks. Merry Christmas to you, too. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Uh, I just want to know one thing, how long would it take for the culture to be able to accept the idea of a 0% tax rate and how long would it take and what would need to happen in the culture for that to occur? Well, I mean, a culture would have to change dramatically so that they would see that the role of government, they would understand that the role of government um, is... Uh, is only to protect individual rights. So uh, as long as it takes to explain that and to convince the culture of that, now I happen to think that's going to take a long time. We're talking about 20 to 100 years uh, before the culture is ready to accept what the founding fathers understood 200 plus years ago, which is that the job of government is to protect our rights, period. That's it. And that means that the government should be composed of almost entirely 
police, military, and judiciary. And that's true not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level. So uh, until we have that kind of realization, you're not going to see the kind of dramatic changes I would like to see on the tax side because you can't change taxes until you change spending. Um, so Skylight, it's going to take a long time. Maybe in your lifetime, certainly not in mine. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Maybe, we'll see. maybe. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Skylight. Merry Christmas. Appreciate your call. Uh, Mark, Mark from uh, Michigan. How's it going? Hey, Yaron. Hey. Um, yeah, so you were talking um, with another caller about the effects of, of the tax plan changes in his life. Sure. From my perspective, I'm kind of a, a young guy just starting out my career, and I'm looking at the changes in the uh, individual side, and that's worth a couple thousand dollars per year, which seems kind of nice. It'll be worth even more if I have kids. But it seems like over half of the benefit that the White House is talking about for me is their projected effect on wage growth yeah. due to the corporate yeah. tax cut. And I was wondering, it seems to me there's a big uh, debate. Of, they, the kids come out with this number about like $4,000 per working family over some amount of time of, of wage increase. And yeah, yeah. it'd probably be that that or more for me if that's true. <laughs> so I'm wondering what, what you think about that. Well, claim. I mean, to put a number on it and to put a time frame on it is what I call voodoo economics. It's just it's just somebody has a formula. They stick some numbers in. It's 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 random and it's meaningless. What you will see is for jobs, particularly where there is competition for workers. If you're in an industry where people are competing for you, where you have a lot of alternatives, wages will go up. I don't think anybody knows by how much. Um, economic research does not suggest exactly by how much. It's not, as I said, it's not going to be uniform. It depends on the industry. It depends on the company. It depends on your profession. It depends on whether you're starting out or whether you're very senior. The more it's likely that the more senior people will get more uh, of the benefit than the junior people. The more productive people will get more than the less productive people. And the, the, the more you have bargaining power as an employee, which means the more special you are in a sense, the more you'll see an advantage from the corporate tax decrease. So... To put a number on it is, I think, meaningless. And to try to put a number on it is meaningless. I, I really think it is kind of voodoo economics. And I wouldn't trust, I wouldn't trust that number. So, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I can't help there. So, I'm glad you're going to have $2,000 more because of the ta individual tax cut. That's easier to calculate. I think if you're, if you're single and you don't have a mortgage and all these other stuff, then it's easy to calculate and it's easy to see that you're getting a benefit. For me... Because I live in California, because I have a big mortgage, because I've been paying the alternative minimum tax, because uh, I, I pay a lot of taxes, state, state, federal, and local, I'm not sure what effect the tax is going to have on me. Now, as I've hinted at in previous shows, I'm making a move in January that's going to affect my taxes dramatically. So to some extent, none of this is relevant to me, but I'll, I'll let you guys all know about that later on uh, in January. But um, so I don't know if I stayed where I am, what impact it would have. I have no clue. But I wish you luck, Mark. You know, you should go to your boss. Uh, do you work for a corporation? Yeah, yeah, a big corporation. Yeah, so I would go to your boss and say, hey, corporate tax rate has gone down. I want to raise. See how that, see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Same time I'm we're kidding. I do not so. recommend that at all. Uh, I would wait a little bit, but then... Uh, you know, if, if you really do, if, if, if you really are in a profession where you, other people are, are looking to hire you, where you've got options, yeah, you, you can go and ask for a raise. And, and, and I think over time, the corporations will be much more agreeable to that uh, than otherwise. All right. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for calling. And again, I hope, I hope you get at least $4,000 over the next few years of raises because of these tax cuts. I mean, generally... Um, the less money politicians have and the more we have, the better. The problem is the politicians can borrow the money. And, and that's why, to me, from again, from a big economic perspective, 
tax cuts matter less. Government spending matters more because if they don't tax us and get the money, they suck that money out of the private economy by, by borrowing it. And, and it does just as much harm sitting in the hands of politicians because they borrowed it as it does sitting in the hand of politicians if they, if they tax it. Still sucking money out of the private economy, sucking money away from investments, sucking money away from raises and, and giving it to government bureaucrats to spend you got to fix the spending side. You got to cut spending, Congress. Let's hope maybe next year before the 2018 election, maybe they will try to do that. I, I have my doubts, but maybe, maybe we can, we can hope. Um, okay, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, Michael, I know you're on there from Tennessee. Uh, I definitely want to get to you. But what I'm going to do is take a quick break, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Michael to talk about tax instead of in child's credits. And then if we have time, I still want to talk about deregulation and a bunch of other things, um, which, uh, yeah, we'll see if we have time for. All right, uh, we'll be, you're listening to your Ron Brook Show and on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be right back after this break. You're clear. Sir, prolific media contributor, PhD in finance. This is the Yaron Brook Show. The Blaze. The Yaron Brooks Show. All right, we're back. We're talking tax reform today, and, and I'm curious how these taxes are affecting you. Uh, are your taxes, do you think, going to go up? Are they going to go down? For most of us, they're going to go down. Is it dramatic? Are you excited about this tax reform? Is it is it a positive in your life, or is it a negative? Uh, you can call in 888-900-3393. 888-900-3393. And then in the final segment, in about 30 minutes, you can call in and ask a question about anything you want to. So uh, completely open lines in that segment. We've got Michael. And Miles remembered his third point. All right, Miles. So Miles, we're going to we're gonna get to Miles as well in this segment. Okay, Michael, so uh, you want to talk about tax incentives and child's credits? Yeah, I heard you uh, kind of ask why why would you need uh, incentives to have children and and uh, I mean I know that you'll probably reject this answer, but from my understanding, <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, right. from my understanding the the rationale behind this is so that you can boost birth rates of your native population because as you know the European and American birth rates are pretty lackluster. And there's projections that will be extinct in like 100 years if it keeps going the way it's going, which it probably won't. But and their argument is that uh, it's easier it's easier to socialize people who have grown up in that culture rather than bring in people from a different culture. Not only uh, not not that you shouldn't do that. You should yeah. always bring in the best and the brightest people right. who who have skills. I 100 percent support that. But I, I I just wanted to maybe get your thoughts on that, and then I was going to ask you a little bit about FHA just real quick if you sure. have time. Sure. So let me just say about child credit. So if you're middle class or upper middle class or wealthy, the child credits have no impact on you because it's small, and, and it's you're not going to have kids because you're incentivized to have kids financially, right? You're doing pretty well. And, and that's where the birth rates are particularly low. So where the child credits actually have an impact is if you're relatively poor and, and young when you can't afford kids. Well, do we really want to incentivize people, single mothers, uh, poor people, to have more kids when they can't really afford them? Think about it. If, if you're going to have a if, – if what's going to make the difference between having a kid or not is the child credit, should you really have the kid? Really? I mean, is that what should drive you to have children, given how much work children are, how, given how expensive children are, given everything that's involved in raising children? Is the, the new $2,000 credit, is that what should incentivize you to have them? I don't buy it. Now, let's be honest about what this demographic issue is. It's white people not having enough kids. That's what they're concerned about, right? Because Hispanics seem to have a lot of kids, right? So uh, do we really, is that what we're doing? So, so this is kind of a racist policy to try to incentivize white people to have more kids? I mean, really? I mean, is that where we are as a country? Just get rid of the child credit. It, it, it's just, 
it, it, it's just not right. It's just, you know, it's just, it, it, it creates wrong incentives. Let me, let me be very blunt. You shouldn't have kids if you can't afford to have them. Kids are expensive. If you don't have right. time to take care of them, don't have kids. If, you don't, if you're not mature enough to have them, don't have kids. If you don't realize, well, nobody actually realizes, but if you're not willing to put in the effort, the work, the long hours, the sleepless nights to have kids, don't have them. You know, so not, so I, I you know, this demographic stuff is very, very, very dangerous and, and very, very, very um, scary. I mean, uh, France has, I mean, Europe, they, they're really doing this. They're, they're in Poland right now, they're massively incentivizing people to have children. I mean, this is bad, bad policy. It's awful. And again, you're, you're basically incentivizing poor people more than anybody else. So, uh, uh, you know, what, it really is socially just horrible. There's nothing wrong with having a low birth rate. Um, if uh, the economy is free uh, and, and uh, the economy is growing and there is prosperity. The problem is that in a lot of countries, I mean, there's no problem with low birth rate, period. People should, be, people should choose. Now, I think low birth rates, particularly in Europe and, and particularly in, and with some Americans, are a consequence of cynicism about the future. Uh, having children is an optimistic <laughs> statement about the future. And I think the more cynical, the more negative, the more pessimistic the culture becomes about the future, the fewer kids we have. Uh, now, I'm not saying the difference is between eight and one. I'm thinking about between, th between two and zero, between three and zero. Uh, a lot of couples in Europe uh, don't have kids. And I think, I think it's a lot because, um, because they're pessimistic about the future. I think, it's, I think for a lot of people, it's rational not to have children. So I don't think there's a right level of uh, right number of kids uh, but I do think it's much more cultural than it is financial and we should leave it as cultural and if there's a cultural problem let's fix the cultural problem let's not try to manipulate people with taxes that's a general principle don't manipulate people with taxes all right what's your second second question right. about housing all right. Oh, I absolutely agree with what you said. We should we never should uh, incentivize single motherhood for sure. Yep. Uh, I don't know about the demographics in, in terms of race. I know it does affect class, but I don't want to get down that road. <laughs> yeah. If it's doing that, that's evil. Yep. But uh, okay, so some of my some of my friends, people that I know, have taken advantage of the FHA loans, which allows first time buyers to get a pretty good rate. Um, if their credit screwed up from the start, see, I was that because I have a little bit of experience in this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes, some sometimes people, when they get eighteen, they have they have bad credit. Sometimes yep. they have no credit. Sometimes yeah. they have good credit. Like I had a friend who had a perfect score right when he turned eighteen. Yeah. I was actually one of the people who had bad credit, which had made no sense. Yeah. And sometimes that puts people behind the eight ball. Uh, I've had to build my credit up over the years, obviously, but I've had friends take advantage of this FHA loan if they can prove that they work and pay their bills, yep. um, that they can get a good uh, a deal uh, sure. to kind of remedy the bad hand that they were given by chance. I mean, I don't know what goes into all that, but yeah. I wanted to get your, your thoughts on something like that. What do you think about it? I mean, because I think it it's, again, it I, think, I think it's terrible policy. Why should young people be incentivized to buy a home? Is buying a home the rational decision? And it might be if you're subsidizing their mortgage, but why should I be subsidizing a mortgage for a young person? Why should I be subsidizing anybody's mortgage? So, <coughs> no, I think FHA loans and Freddie and Fannie and American housing policy is what led to the, to the financial crisis in 2008. I think that the FHA loans only require 2.5% down or 3.5% down, something ridiculous like that. Uh, they, they're on terms that are unrealistic. It, it, no, I mean, the market should be completely private. And if that means fewer people own homes, that means fewer people own homes. Who cares? Why, again, why is the government trying to get you to buy a house rather than rent a house? Why are central planners deciding what the home ownership rate should be in any particular country? None of their business. I mean, you as an individual decide based on market prices, based on the market's evaluation of your credit quality, whether you should buy a home or not. 
and politicians and central planners and treasury departments and the president of the United States should all stay out of it, out of it. One of the reasons we got the, the, the 2008 financial crisis is exactly because these kind of things where the FHA is only demanding 7.5% down on homes. That's ridiculous. I mean, and it puts you in a bad situation because if home prices go down by more than 7.5%, you now owe more on the house than what the house is worth. Why would anybody ever take out 92.5% leverage on anything? And why would the government motivate you to do that, to do something stupid like that? So, yeah, because they think home prices can only go up. Well, people are going to be surprised. Home prices sometimes go down. And they did in 08 and 09 and 10 in many places. So, no, I'm against the FHA doing any of that. I would shut down the FHA as one of the first things I did as president. But don't worry, nobody's one electing reason, me. Yeah. One well, of the reasons I ask is it's not really, it's not really, it's kind of a unique program because it's not really um, incentivizing bad people to own homes. They won't loan to you if you don't have a good job. Yeah, history, but they're incentivizing you, you to take on more leverage than you should, and they're subsidizing you owning a home above and beyond, you know, at my expense. Why? Right. Why? Why would you take out 90% leverage on any asset? Any asset. Don't do it. Good financial planners will always tell you, don't do it. And, and so they're incentivizing you to take on a huge amount of leverage. And on top of that, I'm subsidizing it because I have to pay higher taxes because of it. Because when you default, who has to, who has to back up the FHA? Well, the, the taxpayers do. So no, I'm, right. I'm against, again, any government program that tries to manipulate you into particular economic behavior. That makes sense? All right. I'm yeah, a radical. I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> I know. You're fine. No, I, I'm actually kind of with you. The, I just, I, I don't know if people are that easily manipulated. I think they have a choice. Oh, they're easily manipulated. I'm easily manipulated. I have a much bigger mortgage <laughs> because I can deduct it for my taxes than I would otherwise. Because it makes rational right. sense to me. But why, am I, why have I got this crazy mortgage? Why? Because I can deduct it from my taxes. So I'm, I'm manipulated. I know I'm being manipulated, but it's in my self-interest to be manipulated because, because it has a financial mm. bottom line. But, I, but, but, but in a real world, I would never take the kind of mortgage I have today. So, right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks. Get, well, get well, okay, buddy? I will. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got Miles on the line. I'm going to wait on Miles because uh, we're coming up on a hard break that I can't really push forward. So, Miles, I'm going to take your call as soon as we come back. Here's the principle. The government should not be intervening in our lives. The government should not be intervening in our lives, neither for good nor bad, other than to protect us, to protect us from bad people, which means to protect us from force, from fraud, from, steal, from people stealing, from people committing violent acts against us. They should protect us from foreign invaders and terrorists. But other than that, you know, the government should leave 30. us alone. It, it, it should butt out. It shouldn't incentivize me to buy a home or, or rent a home or not buy a home or not rent a home. How many kids to have or not have? 20. Or to get married or not married? It should be neutral about all those things. That's what a rational government would do. That's what the founders Ten. would do. All right, you're listening to the Ron Brooks Show. We're on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Ron Brooks Show on right, the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we're talking taxes all day today. So uh, taxes, 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 taxes. If you want to talk taxes, how is this tax plan going to affect you or how you think it will affect the economy or for that matter, if you want to talk about anything, we're getting to that part of the show, close to that part of the show, where I'm willing to take calls on any topic you want to talk about. You can call in. It's 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393. And Miles is on the line. Miles, who called in earlier and had two, had three comments on the taxes but could only remember two, has now remembered the third one. Hey, Miles, thanks for calling back. All right. Thank you, Jaron. Uh, 
my third uh, point, which ironically has to do with housing, which is what you were speaking yep, of yep. Uh, last last uh, segment. Um, you obviously you, you don't uh, believe in incentivizing uh, uh, people to buy houses through, through taxes. Um, I don't believe in incentivizing people to buy houses. Period. Okay. Um, and eliminating, uh, uh, you know, some of these deductions uh, or capping them uh, certainly would would uh, disincentivize people from buying houses. But but I guess my question is, the the present the new tax reform plan yeah. uh, with its with its salt cap, um, together with uh, the Fed rate increases which have already started and are projected to continue, do you think that that's going to have a depressing effect? On the housing market, and, and you know, when we back, and we will be back to a, a 2008 situation. Yeah, so far we're not seeing it, particularly on the Fed side. Let me get to the salt cap in a minute, but on the Fed side, because uh, the yield curve is pretty flat. So while the Fed is raising short-term rates, long-term rates are not going up, and mortgage rates are set by long-term rates more than they are by short-term rates, unless you have a variable rate mortgage which in these days is insanity because the, the, the 30-year mortgages and 15-year mortgages are show, so have such low interest rates that it's a no-brainer to get one of those. If you have a variable rate mortgage, then, then yeah, it's, it's a little disin- disincentivizing the rising rate. But uh, the flat yield curve, which are troubling from an economic perspective because when the yield curve gets inverted, that is long-term rates are, are, sh- are lower than short-term rates, it's usually a precursor to recession. And we're not quite inverted, but we're fairly flat. And, and if, if you start seeing it being inverted, start worrying. Um, so I think that doesn't seem to have an, 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 an impact on, on mortgages yet. Uh, if, the, if the 5 and 10-year and 30-year bonds interest rates on them go up, which they haven't yet, then you'll see mortgage rates go up. Now, the, the inability to deduct SALT and the new – Reduction in um, deduction from a million to seven hundred and fifty thousand is definitely going to hurt California and New York. So it's going to hurt people living in San Francisco. It's going to hurt people living in L.A. We all here own homes that are worth more than a million dollars. We have million dollar mortgages because we thought we could deduct the whole million. Now we can only deduct seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, interest on, and uh, of course we can't deduct our, our property taxes in our. Uh, uh, the complete property taxes, and we can't deduct any of our sales, uh, any of our uh, income taxes on state and local, that's going to really hurt New York and California. Now, I think that's a good thing because, again, why, why should California and New York get a break for the bad economic policies that they're engaged in? So, um, uh, uh, you know, to the extent that we can uh, incentivize California to reduce its state taxes, to the extent that we can incentivize New York to do the same, uh, to the extent that this puts downward pressure on home prices, that's a good thing. I mean, let me say something about home prices. I don't have a lot of time to get really into this, but let me just say this. House prices should not overall, on average, go up. Housing is a consumption product. When you buy a house, you're consuming something. And when you live in it, you're using it. You're using the house. The value of the house should be going down. Just like when you buy a car, and as soon as you drive it off a lot, the price goes down. Why is it when you buy a house, you expect the price to go up? Houses should not be investments. Houses are consumption. The only reason house prices are going up is because of government policy. Uh, house prices have been going up significantly since uh, the late 70s. And the reason, the primary reason, and they're going up primarily in California and New York and a few other places, is primarily because of government policies, government policies that restrict supply. When you restrict restrict supply in places that are attractive for people to live, you cause home prices to go up. There's absolutely no reason why home prices should continuously go up in San Francisco, but they've been going up since 1979. Why? Because in the late 70s, California passed all these environmental laws that made it impossible to build new homes because everything was allocated to green spaces. Also, because in places like San Francisco, you're not allowed to build up. You're not allowed to build high condo towers, except in the downtown area. 
outside of the downtown area, you're not allowed to build a high condo tower. Now, why? Because people who already have homes in San Francisco don't want you to because it'll lower the value of their homes because there'll be more supply. So uh, the, the solution, so in a free market, home prices should be flat. And, and you would never view a home as an investment. You view a home as something you consume. And you wouldn't care that much whether you were renting or whether you were buying. Just like in a car, it's, it's moderately, it's unclear what's better, to lease a car or to buy a car. It depends on your tax situation and stuff like that. But why would you care? So, um, so again, I think our whole perception of housing as this, investment product, it only goes up, and when it goes down, oh my God, the world is going to end. That is a consequence of bad government policy. So I'm not worried about housing declines. I think they should decline in some areas. They're way too expensive in California. People can't afford to live here. So why do we care only about the people who already own the homes? Why don't we care about the people who want to move into California and who can't afford to come here? What about all the people who would love to come to California because their job's here, but they don't move here because the cost of living is too high? So, yeah, again, I want government to get out of the business of telling me, incentivizing me, motivating me, anything about housing. I want a neutral housing market where supply and demand is based on the market and my financial incentives are based on the market, not on government. Central planners cannot know whether it's good for me to buy or to rent, whether it's good for me to buy you know, whether it's good for my house to appreciate or stay or depreciate in value. You know, central planning is bad. I, I don't know how to get that through to you guys, but it's bad. I, it, Miles, I, I went on and on there. I don't know if you want, if you have a follow-up on that. I don't, uh, no, I, I, my only follow-up is just to gauge your consistency. Sure. Do you feel that taxes uh, on the business side, there should be no incentives on the business side? Or Absolutely. Uh, Zero incentives, no subsidies, no loopholes. No cronyism, nothing. Now, I believe that the best way to achieve that is to reduce corporate taxes to zero because, because uh, corporate taxes are paid by, by, by uh, lower wages and higher-priced goods. I, almost all research shows that. So the only rational corporate tax rate is zero. But if you had a corporate tax rate, let's say the 21% now, I believe in no loopholes, no deductions, no subsidies, nothing. Just a flat rate. Uh, you know, straight business expenses are deducted. You take that profit and you have a tax rate on it. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. doesn't matter any of these things. You make it as simple and as straightforward as possible. Yes, I'm, I'm consistent. I don't believe the government should be manipulating business investment, telling them what they should invest in, solar energy versus this energy. Just flat, simple, no intervention. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. I, I don't know if I'm... If I'm gaining adherence to my run for the president or not, but, uh, you know, we're building up for that. We're building up for that. All right. Let's see. Um, we're going to take let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to we're going to talk to Naveen. Naveen wants to take us in a slightly different direction because I think he wants to raise the issue of Bitcoin. All right. You're listening to your run book show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. Be clear. Author, prolific media contributor, PhD in finance. This is the Yaron Book Show. Yaron Book. All right, you're listening to the Yaron Book Show, and we're talking, we'll be talking taxes the whole time. A little. Uh, deviation here and there into uh, things like housing. So let me just say something about the housing. Uh, somebody on uh, on Facebook says, uh, uh, yeah, but population growth would cause house prices to go up. No. Why would that happen? So population growth causes iPhone prices to go up. Population growth causes automobile prices to go up. No. When population grows, you build more houses. There is plenty and plenty and plenty of land to build more housing so the supply meets, meets demand. So the fact that demand goes up doesn't mean uh, prices go up unless supply is constrained. And supply is not constrained. It shouldn't be constrained. It is constrained by government. But it shouldn't be constrained. So no, housing prices 
should not have to go. Uh, should not have to go. Uh, should not have to go up. Um, capital investment. Just you're, you're still getting a profit on selling those houses. So the fact that there are more people, more people buying houses, does not cause uh, the price of housing to go up uh, any more than causes the prices of cars to go up when when uh, demand. Over time, when demand for cars go up, it, prices of cars do not go up. Look at inflation-adjusted prices of automobiles. They're not going up. Not because of, uh, because of regulations, yes, but because yeah, they, they have to have more and more components and they have to have uh, better gas fuel mileage and all of that. But independent of that, automobiles are becoming cheaper and cheaper. It costs less and less to build a home today than it did 50 years ago. And suddenly, if you'd allow free markets in housing, it would cost even cheaper to do that. And then the other one is, um, but you want, aren't you for paying less taxes? So don't you want all these deductions so you can pay less taxes? Yes, absolutely, I want less taxes. But I want less taxes through the tax rate. The fact that they are picking win- winners and losers is massively detrimental to my life because it is encouraging and supportive of cronyism, which is destroying capitalism as w- in America today. It's destroying not just the, 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 the mentality of the CEOs, the mentalities of businessmen, but it also is destroying people's belief that capitalism is a good system. Cronyism is one of the most destructive forces in the world today. And cronyism is enhanced dramatically by the various loopholes and deductions and exclusions that exist in the corporate tax code. And on the personal level, it is so destructive to have all these incentives and motivations and picking winners and losers, even on the personal level, that what we should be fighting for is a lower rate with no exclusions, deductions, nothing coming out because they're unjust, they're immoral, they're, and they're, they're bad economically and they're bad for my and your life. So I never want anybody to pay more taxes. God forbid. But... We live in a crazy world where somebody's paying more taxes. So uh, if I look at what the solution is, the solution that's realistic in terms of lobbying for, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a simplification, it's a flatness, and it's, it's getting rid of all the deductions and exclusions as we convince the world that, that the proper amount of spending is probably 10% of what the government spends today. And therefore, taxes can be pretty close to zero. Um, somebody asked about taxes and royalties. I don't know what taxes and royalties for authors are. I, I, all, the, all the royalties I get on my books go to the Ayn Rand Institute. So uh, um, they don't even come to me. They, they automatically go to the Ayn Rand Institute. All right. As you guys should all be doing, you should all be contributing money to the Ayn Rand Institute. This is December, after all. This is the season of making those uh, tax deductible. They didn't touch a charity contribution. So you can deduct uh, charity from your taxes. Uh, And if you're going to give charity, the most important charity, the only charity that really makes a difference in the world out there is the Ayn Rand Institute because you were actually fighting for making you all much wealthier long term and making the world a far, far better place for everybody long term. So uh, fight for that. All right, let's uh, let's take this call from Naveen. I can't wait to talk about Bitcoin. Hey, Naveen. Hey, Ron. Thanks for taking the call. Sure. Um, and it's a, it's a slightly um, general question, but sure. also very related to what you're talking about right now. Uh, because, um, yeah, can you, so my question is, can you talk about um, Bitcoin in general, what you see as the future for it, right, uh, as far as adoption? And, you know, right now the price is going up uh, significantly. But also uh, the question is about how you see this affecting um, government regulation and power and the social engineering that they're doing right now because I've heard some people say that this is, some libertarians especially, talk about how this is um, an avenue for us to take away the power from the government because it's all anonymous and when more and more people start trading in cryptocurrencies and uh, by these means, it basically takes away all the power from government. Yep. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, I hope they're right, but I'm skeptical. And, and, and let, me, let me tell you 
my, my view of, of Bitcoin, and this is true of, of most cyber currencies out there. I believe that for money to be money, it has to be backed by something tangible. It, it, it's the cost of mining it is not what makes money money. It's the fact that it has value beyond the money. So it's, it, that's what gives it the store of value. That's why it has a value. So gold, you can use in industry, you can use in jewelry. It has value beyond its use as money. So if for some reason people stop using it money, we can still use it for something else. So it still has, it's, it's worth something in terms of money, even if it's not used as money. And it gains its actual value from its alternative uses, from the competition on its uses. So uh, and Bitcoin doesn't have that. Bitcoin is, is a fiat money in the sense that it's not backed by anything tangible that has other value. So what? why are people so excited about Bitcoin? Why does it have a value? And I think it does have a value. And I think the value it has is the anonymity, the ability to use it to do illegal stuff. And the more people want to do illegal stuff, the more people are incentivized to do illegal stuff, the more people think it's just for them to do illegal stuff or rights for them to, the greater the value Bitcoin has. Now, what is that value? I don't know because I don't know how many people there are out there who are interested in doing anonymous illegal stuff. I, I, and I don't know how much they'll use it. And I don't know. I don't know. So I don't know what the price is. And for that matter, I don't know that anybody knows what the price is. And right now, what we're seeing is market speculation trying to figure out what the price is. I suspect that what's driving up the cost right now is is just sheer emotion and and speculation because it, markets don't go up 40% in two days. Markets don't have the kind of volatility Bitcoin has right now when they're rational, when they're truly engaged in price discovery. I expect uh, Bitcoin to collapse at some point. I don't know when the bubble will, will, pr will prick. It looks like a lot of the... Um, energy behind uh, Bitcoin speculation coming out of Asia. It's coming out of individual investors in Asia. I think there will be a point in which either because the government clamps down or something happens in China or whatever, that that disappears and the market will collapse. And then we will get real price discovery, just like what was the internet worth? Well, you couldn't tell in 99, but once the bubble burst and the market became more rational, then ultimately we could get a sense, okay, okay, this is what Amazon's really worth. This is what Google's really worth, right? I think the same thing will happen with Bitcoin and with other cryptocurrencies. As for making government regulation obsolete, I mean, we can hope, but I doubt it because government have a gun. They have criminal law. They can kill Bitcoin by using that gun. The anonymity is not that anonymous you still have to store it there's still servers now i know the technology guys can come up with answers for every one of my complaints but i still believe that the guys with the guns the guys writing criminal law have the last say and therefore this is why governments are not that worried this is why they haven't outlawed bitcoin yet because they don't believe it will happen Two minutes. and i think they're actually right so while i would love to say Bitcoin is going to save us from statism. I just don't see it. I don't see how it happens. And again, I, 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 Bitcoin is always, I think, going to be too volatile to actually serve as a good alternative to real money, to money. Um, and unless uh, what I see as the future of cyber currency, it, cryptocurrency, is a cryptocurrency backed by gold. That, I think, will be the future. But, he, but th the problem there is that the gold reserves have to be in the physical world and the government can shut them down as well. I just don't think we can get around government. The solution to statism, the solution to government, encroachment into our lives is better ideas. It's individual rights. It's One rediscovering minute. the principles of the founding fathers. It's education, education, education. There are no shortcuts. Bitcoin, I do not believe, will provide us a shortcut. Maybe for a while you'll be able to do some illegal things that you couldn't do otherwise, and in that sense you'll feel freer. 
But they'll, if it really starts hampering government regulations, they will shut it down. So freedom depends on education. Freedom mm-hmm. depends on rediscovering the ideas of the founding fathers of this country. Freedom depends on the 30. simple concept, not so simple complex, of individual rights and a recognition that the only job of government is to defend those rights. Now, you will not hear okay. those ideas on any other show uh, you know, on uh, on uh, mainstream radio, or on The Blaze, or anywhere else. That's why you need to continue listening to your Ron Brooks show on The yeah. Blaze Radio Network. And um, see you all, or listen to you all, or next week, same time, same place. You're clear. You're thank listening you, thank to the you for being patient Brooks with show me. I'm glad I survived that one.